Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. I can remember when we were all young and working at Ms. Magazine that at day's end, Kathy Black would always be sitting in the only brightly lit cubicle of a darkened office. That's because she was poring over figures because she, Kathy, was the advertising manager of this new magazine. Now the lights are on everywhere. She's in a beautiful building and she's president of Hearst Magazines, one of the world's largest publishers of monthly magazines. Thank you, my guest today. Oh, Ronnie, it's great to be here. It's fun <laughs> to catch up with you, yeah. and it's, I'm really very, very pleased. It was, uh, it's wonderful to see you. It wasn't easy going from, it wasn't all so easy going from the circulation, I mean, the, the advertising manager to becoming the publisher of what, 15 magazines, international well, there, there companies, some, everything else? There were some in-between stops, oh, there were. to say. I was, uh, I was at Ms. for about uh, six years, and then I, uh, went out to California briefly to work for Francis Ford Coppola when for a, a nanosecond he bought a magazine in San Francisco and I was its ad director um, and then I returned to Ms. for about another year or so um, and then I went to New York Magazine um, as publisher. And, and you I were had, the first woman. I, when I was think. named publisher in, oh that's it, so long ago, yeah. but when I was named publisher I was the first female publisher of a consumer weekly magazine in the United States. It's amazing. Consumer magazine in the United States. Isn't that States. amazing? Do you feel that old? <laughs> I, I feel, I, sometimes when I look in the mirror, I <laughs> no, feel pretty no, old. <laughs> you look great. Anyway, go on. And then I was at New York for about seven years, uh, and Rupert Murdoch had just purchased, purchased it. People forget that at the time, Rupert was not that well-known mm. um, figure in uh, U.S. media circles. He was certainly well-known, but you know his, his picture was on the cover of Time magazine as the killer bee, mm. um, and so I was there for about seven years. It was a great experience. I love New York Magazine, and it's had an amazing long, long run uh, track record of success. And then I got a phone call from a recruiter one day, and they were kind of probing about um, this launch of this newspaper called USA Today. And the newspaper had launched the year before, or nine months before, and it was on really struggling terms. And so this was intriguing to me. I'd never spent any time in the newspaper business other than a little baby mm -hmm. job in Chicago when I was in high school, I think. And so I started talking with them over the course of the summer. This is in 1983. Um, and to make a long story short, they finally, after talking about different jobs, I said, you know, I think where I could make a contribution is USA Today because they had literally no advertising. They couldn't figure out their advertising strategy. And so I joined in October 1 of 83, which the newspaper was just a year old then. And that was another fantastic seven years. I mean, just hurled into the media spotlight. You know, Ms. had been a very difficult challenge in terms of convincing advertising decision makers <laughs> that a woman's magazine like Ms. was a place for their ad dollars. But there was a lot of hostility, you'll remember this, I mean there was a lot of hostility to the word feminist, to what the women's movement was all about, and so we had to really quickly learn how to articulate that women were going to think differently about their lives. So I would say when I look back on my own career, the two most challenging, difficult, positions were being the ad manager of Ms. and then also coming to USA Today as a startup. Except that one was on you know this unbelievable yeah. national stage yeah. plus Gannett, the parent company of USA Today, mm. is publicly held. Mm. So I had never been in front of analysts or anything yeah. like that before and I can still remember the first <laughs> analyst meeting and our th then chairman uh, Al Newhart who was the founder of the newspaper, he, he was he, they always put him at the end of it, a long day of you know presentation after presentation because he was very funny and he was in the, the stock for Gannett had done phenomenally well. Um, but I remember afterward he would do a cocktail party and it was surrounded by all of these analysts and I hadn't said anything at the at the meeting or maybe very brief remarks but these analysts were like all around me like you know what does the ad picture look like when's it gonna make money is it in the black and on and he walked by me and he whispered into my ear some of the best advice <laughs> I have ever received he said don't tell them more than you know Oh, good. It was great. It, it's it's great life advice because of course you want to look smart. Yeah. And all of a sudden Absolutely. you're trapped into something. Absolutely. And I didn't want to be reading about Kathy Black. So right. you know, right. be, of course it wasn't profitable for a long time. But in any event, it was a great seven yeah. years. Really a great. It was. Seven it's. Years. A, it was an amazing magazine. I mean, it is an amazing newspaper, and it's always when you're traveling around, you always get USA Today. But I remember we were doing a television show. It was my husband, and we would travel around the country, and we got stories from the little. Yeah things from the states. Absolutely. I loved reading those yes. little tidbits about what important thing went on in what state. That has always been one of the most popular and well-read right? pages um, in That's the newspaper. 
And, you know, it, it breaks my heart to see newspapers in, under such oh. challenging times. I mean, our own company, Hearst, the corporation, owns 90 yes. newspapers, 11 of them outright, and the other 79. And, and daily, from, they're dailies and weeklies. Dailies, and mostly dailies, yeah. but uh, dailies and weeklies. But, you know, the newspaper industry, you know, obviously is, is hugely struggling mm -hmm. uh, as they're trying to figure out, you know, can there be a business model and can there be a strategy? So we're trying all um, a zillion different things. And you were you were the head of the Newspaper Publishers mm -hmm. Association, so you were for the spokesperson for newspapers. Uh, I was. In fact, ironically, new media <laughs> was just coming on to the scene, if you will, and our offices were in suburban Washington and AOL was literally okay. down the street. And some it's young amazing. kid joined us in the new media department yeah. that we had, and we would debate, you know, AOL stock was like $3. Should we buy some? <laughs> I mean, it's just so funny to think of it. Yeah. Uh, but I got to know the um, CEO of the Hearst Corporation in my time as being chairman of, I mean, uh, uh, when I was president of the yeah. Newspaper Association of America. And so he called me in a, my, I mean, we would see each other a couple yeah. times here or at functions and, and whatever. But one day he called me and he said, would I ever consider a move back to New York? And I was married, I mean, I am married, was married then, and had two small children. And I said, well, for the right job, of course. So we had lunch, and he said, you know, we had a couple of different meetings, and he said, would you consider being president of Hearst Magazines? And you were a privately held company, so I must admit, I really didn't know how large, well, no, I knew oh. the difference, but oh. I didn't know how large a portfolio the magazine division was. We have about 28, we publish 15 magazines in the United States. We have a huge international business. Right. We have a company in the UK that publishes 25 magazines. We publish uh, 200 editions in 100 countries. I mean, for example, Cosmo yeah. is in 61 countries. <laughs> Wherever it goes, it's like the number one magazine of all. Is it a translation of what is here, or is well, it original? we don't have a literal formula. If we open up <coughs> in a country, they normally will use about 70 or 80 percent of the material from the U.S. edition. And then over time, it's probably more like 50-50 or maybe even a slightly higher percentage that's created locally or in that particular so country. So interesting because it really shows how similar yes. people can be. Well, you know, and everyone Fair. thinks they can kind of knock off Cosmo, but co you can't knock off Cosmo. Yeah. I mean, it's so much in its DNA. But for example, the Russian edition of Cosmo yeah. sells a million copies a month, which makes it the largest selling young woman's magazine in all of Europe. Isn't, that Isn't amazing? that amazing? It really yeah. is just astonishing. Yeah. And you lo I love magazines. I, I love know. the I, I mean I love the touch. I love the fact that there's so many different things. I love looking at the pictures and everything else. Are they really threatened, do you think? Here's the way I phrase it. We do not have a consumer problem. We don't have a reader problem. Right now, we have an advertising problem, as does the entire industry. And I think perhaps it's a couple of things. Number one, maybe a little bit of the bleed coming off the negativity uh, connected to newspapers kind of shook up advertisers or their ad agencies a little bit. But also, you know, is there... This, is this including the economic situation, the financial condition of, of the country? Um, or are we I, excluding oh, it? Oh, yeah. No, I, 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 I absolutely. I mean, for example, yeah. you know, we sell tons of magazines at the newsstand. Mm -hmm. Now, newsstand can be on 57th Street mm -hmm. or it can be at the, your local supermarket or at Walmart or Costco yeah. or whatever. You know, so that person for whom three dollars and fifty cents or four dollars, you know, depending, um, that's a you know, it's a considered purchase in mm -hmm. a in a really down economy. It certainly is. So we're off about ten percent on the newsstand, and we have some very big magazines. I mean, here's the Oprah magazine, and so we'll sell anywhere, give or take, between seven eight hundred thousand copies on the newsstand. Although right now, this is just hilarious. <laughs> this is the uh, this is the cover of O. So that's Ellen DeGeneres and Oprah. Oh, but now we'll, Ellen, all the discussion. Ellen challenged Oprah and said, I want to be the first person ever, in addition to yourself, that's been on the cover. Uh -huh. And so they went back and forth and back and forth for months and months and months. And then finally, ironically, Ellen is in the Cover Girl ad campaign. So in our, I want to say September it's issue, makeup. she holds it up on her show, and here's Ellen's picture in the Cover Girl um, yeah. Ad. ad. And so she holds it up and said, Oprah, I'm on the second cover. How about bumping me up to the first cover? So she challenged it. So Oprah finally agrees. Then, then Ellen started a countdown. 
and she had a clock on her show for like 60 days, and every day she would remind her viewing audience that the Oprah issue that she'd be on the cover of, the December issue, would be on the okay. newsstands approximately December 5th, uh, November 15th, and so she revealed it on her show a week ago Friday, and what she said to her studio audience was, help us make it the best-selling issue ever of Oprah. So we will be uh, north of a test. million copies. So it's, it's <laughs> and then phenomenal. in the meantime, Oprah announces that she's going to end the program, right. and Ellen is one of the people talked about most to be her replacement. So people you know, will it's, take it's this amazing. as a whole Oprah thing. Oprah has had just this unbelievable North Star. Yes, I mean, she, she certainly She knows has. what is good for her. Um, this isn't a huge surprise. I mean, she has said that she would come mm -hmm. off air at different times, mm -hmm. but then she changed her mind. I, I don't think she probably will change her mind, but mm -hmm. I never speak yeah. for Oprah. She can only speak yeah, right, for herself. Exactly. <laughs> um, but she's very true to who she is. And yeah. so the magazine has been an enormous success, really. Let's, and it's a beautiful magazine. The, how, what percentage of the revenue comes from newsstand sales? It depends which, which magazine you're talking oh, about. The most successful magazines, like an Oprah, like Cosmo, like Good Housekeeping, they'll be very much in balance. It might be 60% advertising, to 40% circulation. Some magazines are 80% advertising, uh, advertising revenue, and less so either newsstand and subscriptions. When you get that kind of a balance, and then you hit this kind of a skid as we have in terms of advertising, that magazine is really struggling. But it's the ones where it's more equally in balance that are, not only are they huge profit makers, but also even in times like this, you've still got really a, a bedrock of, a bedrock, I should say, of two streams of revenue. When you uh, in the circulation, uh, how many subscriptions versus uh, newsstand sales? Well, for example, with, with Oprah, we're 2.4 million, and so we are give or take about a million and a half subscriptions, mm -hmm. and the balance being mm -hmm. on the newsstand. Mm -hmm. uh, Cosmo, Cosmo's October issue sold 1.8 million copies on the newsstand, and they have about a million subscribers. So those are real machines. So we, we, yeah. we guard them very carefully. And now you think you have a new machine. We hope so. With Food uh, Network. Food Network, we launched uh, just a few months ago. Um, this is the December issue that you're looking at here. It'll sell somewhere around 370,000 copies on the newsstand, and we have 1.1 um, million um, uh, excuse me, we have about 700,000 subs, subscriptions, so in total we're about 1.1 million. Isn't that incredible? It's great. And do you, you estimate that it's going to grow? I mean, do you do we the projections? We think so. I mean, yeah. we look at where food magazines are. Uh -huh. Rachel Ray's is, uh -huh. is the largest. Um, and unfortunately, and Gourmet new, just too. closed yeah. uh, you know, a, a few right. weeks ago, which was sad for everybody. But th this, is, you know, this is a partnership with the Food Network television right. channel, which is hugely popular. Right. Everybody and watches. And they really love it. Okay. You know, I ask always. All I kinds mean, of people. I was, in a, uh, <laughs> I was actually giving a lecture at Notre Dame about a month ago. So I said to 150 young people in the audience, men and women, and I said, how many of you watch the Food Network? Because I was talking about the magazine. All their hands go up, or the majority <laughs> of their hands go up. You can ask an advertising audience, their hands go up. Or they smile. You know, they, yeah. they, they love the Food Network. Yeah. They love the, the celebrities. They love the chefs. It's incredible. It's, it's so knock on wood. Uh, we it, hope it'll be now successful. Now, it seems to me that magazines, it's almost, I mean, you're like an executive producer of a whole three-dimensional mm -hmm. thing about magazines. It's not just a magazine anymore. Right. That's interesting. Is that it's a, new? It's, it's an interesting way to put it. Um, yes, I would say it's uh -huh. relatively new in the last, give or take, decade. Uh -huh. I mean, Martha Stewart probably St yeah. started all of that with the brand licensing. Yeah. Um, although we've been in the brand licensing business for a long time. We used to be, for example, House Beautiful would, was the number one selling line of paints mm -hmm. at Walmart. Okay. Um, and Popular Mechanics, an old, uh -huh. a, a magazine that we also produce, was the best selling line of tools at Walmart. Uh, we have a huge uh, venture with Kmart and Sears with a country living line of furniture and bedding, uh, bedding accessories. Um, and we have a small line of uh, like um, uh, food condiments mm -hmm. uh, for country living. So we work with retailers. I mean, you have to have a retail partner to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you obviously have to manufacture it, but you need a retail partner. Um, and so brand licensing, we think you want to keep it within your bandwidth. Mm -hmm. But the editors, who we think of as really the brand stewards, um, they, you know, they're working on television programs, they're working on brand licensing, they're working on books, they're working on the website. Um, they have a very multitasking kind of position today. Sometimes I want to make sure, or I hope, that the eye doesn't get off the magazine ball because all of these other ancillary activities take time, trips, visits, meetings, Every creative day. energy, yeah. you know, all of that. Do you think there's going to be a day when you have your Blackberry out and you can read the magazine? Absolutely. It'll be sooner than you think. I mean, right now, if you had a Kindle, which is an yeah, Amazon product, right. you can download a newspaper. 
We have a couple of experiments going on with magazines. But the Amazon, uh, uh, the Kindle is really designed as a book right. reading experience. You know, there's no graphics. It's just black and white. Well, as you said a few minutes ago, what we love about magazines is design, is the photography, is the are the illustrations, the just the whole feeling of the magazine. So we are just in the midst of creating a consortium of magazine and newspaper publishers to work through all of the issues regarding an e-reading experience. So we don't want to be in the device business because that's going to be a, <laughs> yeah. you know, what you want may be different right. than what I want. But what we care a lot about is that we own the name because uh, we're all about the database. Um, and also there has to be a revenue that's really worthwhile for us. And so we want to figure out the business issues with regard to magazine subscriptions via the web yeah. or via a Blackberry or via yeah. a smartphone or uh, via your iPhone, et cetera. So what I think you'll see products uh, in 2010. Is it just my age that makes me sort of you know, cringe a little bit when I hear that people may be reading magazines on a thing? Well, they're know. reading newspapers now. Yeah, I know. Um, it makes me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing like in the morning having a cup of coffee and reading a newspaper and getting your hands dirty and then having to go to wash them. I mean, I always thought, I'm never going to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> right from reading a newspaper. I have to be home for it. Yeah, because they had literally no as long as I can see. Maybe not all of them, but for about yeah. as long as we can Good. imagine. I think the experience, the connection, the sense of sort of stepping out of a hardwired yeah. world. I mean, I think for some people it's just like a little bit of, of solace or a, a sort of it's like your private time. Yeah. It's like, you know, a cup of tea and sort right. of relaxing you're, or getting ideas. I mean, you can walk into a teenager's room today, and we publish Seventeen magazine which sells about 350,000 copies a month um, and about a million, little more than a million uh, subscriptions. A teenage girl's bedroom, even though they're on 16 different devices all day long, all from day. their laptop, yeah. television, you know, iPhone, et cetera, right. there they've got the boy photos, you know, yeah. ripped out right. from, Cos uh, from, uh, from 17. Or they walk into a store saying, I want that blouse or that uh -huh. skirt that or I whatever. So I think th the brain can kind of rewire itself for uh -huh. what the purpose really of a magazine is all about. How quickly I, do you know that a magazine isn't going to take off? What I mean, what? There's different points of view yeah. about it. Um, we would give it a couple of years, yeah. usually. Um, but the truth is, the dynamics usually work right away. Right. And they don't always get a whole lot better. Um, you know, we published Talk Magazine with mm -hmm. Tina Brown and Harvey Weinstein for mm -hmm. almost two and a half years. and. We could have made that decision sooner, yeah. but it was, you know, you get into the you politics keep, of yeah, right. people, and, and, yeah. and Tina would say to this day that we closed it too soon. Yeah. But, you know, we're, we have to be about the metrics, right. and even though we're a privately held company. Right. So if you're looking at your circulation, is your circulation growing? Um, you know, the insert cards that many people hate because they, they drop all over the they place. Drop, <laughs> are the insert cards coming back in because it meant that somebody read an issue, liked it enough to take out a subscription, and is the advertising there? And the advertising was beginning, but the circulation was really, really, really stagnant. And we just knew that what we had there was a very expensive overhead um, for a magazine that was probably going to be around 300,000 circulation, yeah. not what we had hoped Hopefully. for. So. so she's now on the internet. Yeah, she's, uh, she's got a company called right. The Daily Beast. Right. And I think it's doing pretty well. Right. Now, you had Cosmo Girl mm -hmm. in this wonderful book you write about yes. this exciting young woman who came in with this idea. I just idea. heard from her the other day. Right. You no longer publish that magazine. Right. But it is on the internet? Yes. And is it a Hearst property? Yes. We Isn't have 25 internet properties that either we have, that are the websites for the magazine. So we have 15 magazine mm -hmm. websites. And then we bought a couple of small sites in the teen space. Mm -hmm. We continued publishing, I mean, a website for Cosmo Girl. And a, actually another magazine that we closed called Quick and Simple. Now they're small because there's no way to really drive mm -hmm. the traffic to them um, that significantly. Um, and then we bought a company called Real Age, which is if you want to know your, we know, obviously know your biological age, but if you want to know your real age, as in your health and your fitness and wellness, you can take the Real Age test, which takes 20 now, minutes. I want you to do a, I want you to do a magazine for people like me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, you, I keep looking at these things. I mean, I read some of these magazines and I think, well, that's a nice dress, but that's not a dress for me. When are we, are we ever, it never fits into the demographics, does it? That's the problem. <laughs> I mean, the demographics actually are there. Yeah. Um, and one of our competitors, Meredith, publishes a magazine called More, but I yeah. think you would probably find that that's too yeah. young for you. Um, but it's the advertising equation. It's ridiculous 
But you don't want an, uh, a magazine for somebody, say, over the age of 50 that's only filled with pharma ads, you know, promoting. Right. No, I hate it. You that's, know. It's, it's right. incredible when you so even watch television yeah. and all the pharmaceutical ads. But there are things there, design, yeah. there are clothes, of there are course. all kinds of wonderful of things. Um, in the book, you also, I don't know if it was in the book someplace, that you said you still don't really get a lot of automobile ads. Mm -hmm. And I remember back in Ms. days. Um, it's crazy. Why do they don't think the women buy cars? You know, from my <laughs> earliest days at Ms., right. when they would say, you know, I remember somebody showing me advertising copy for a special woman's campaign. And whenever we would hear that, we'd be like, oh, uh -oh. we know we're not going to like this. Right. The and the Slim. first, <laughs> yeah, the first sentence was slide your body over the Gucci interior. Uh. And you want to say, like, no. We used to say, if you would run that ad in Time or Newsweek, it's perfectly fine right. for Ms. But the woman's market, in our judgment, has never been aggressively sold. And she is not only the one who chooses the car, buys the car, but she also is the one who services the car in right. a traditional household. You know, and most people drive to get to their jobs. Exactly. They don't have the metro so, the way and you we never do. Can, I mean, we carry a lot of automotive new days, advertising. Maybe, in these maybe. new days, yeah, maybe. maybe. And if you listen to car talk, there are a lot of women who call in with their, yes. their problems in the cars, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. Now, let's talk about the book. You, sure. you didn't get there by just sitting around, right? <laughs> you work very hard. Yeah, I always have. You always have. You're born that way. Yeah. It's inside of I, you? Absolutely. It's, I, I don't think you can teach anybody how to work hard. You can suggest it, um, but I think it has to really be in your DNA. I also think it's, I mean, men work very hard as well, yeah. but I think we've had to work harder, harder as women to, again, prove, reprove, reprove again that we are really committed and we're very determined. And so when you started, you really had it in mind a whole career? Or not, not really. I think that for my era, my generation, mm -hmm. so I came into the workforce in 1966, mm -hmm. just out of college. You know, there were very few women role models mm -hmm. or mentors. That didn't really even exist. So I think for most women, or at least for myself, we looked at sort of the job we got and then thought about the next job. Right. So we kind of looked around the office to see, you know, was that going to be an opportunity? I never said to myself, I'm going to be president of Hearst Magazines. So I think for many women, it's much more sequential. You get that job, and then I you agree. start thinking, oh, hey, really? I'm pretty I could good do at that. this. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm good at that. And so I think it's like it's much more stepping stones than it, than it was for men who just assumed. Um, what's the, the old um, Jerry Farrar line, which was, why is it that men assume office with the assumption of success and women assume office with the burden of proof or something, something like, like that. that. That's but very it, good. It, it, but I've never liked that question when you're interviewing somebody, where do you see yourself five years, ten years from now? Because in a way, what you're saying is still true, isn't right, it? Right. I mean, I don't mind somebody saying, you know, I'd, I'd love to have my own company. I've always wanted to have my own company. Right. I just don't know what it should be. Right. But I think that five-year planning, especially in today's world, I it's mean, crazy. it's just, yeah. you know, maybe if you said to somebody, where would you like to be in two years or three years, then I think it's a little more manageable. Because just because somebody says they want to be a CEO, well, you know, hello, it takes a whole bunch of steps in between saying you want that and, and perhaps achieving it or not. So you're really an example of moving ahead because you're really competent. <laughs> I, th I think, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of job you had, you spent, you did it to the best you could. That's right. And you have to prove that you yeah. can do that. Right. Uh, men as well, I mean, I don't think that's a female trait necessarily. Right. I think you have to prove that you really can, whatever that job is, whether it's small or large, that you're going to do it better than, than other people are. I mean, I've always thought that people will be recognized if they do a really, if they focus on that job and really do a good job. I think too many people are too focused about the next, mm -hmm. and they're like not tending mm -hmm. to the I think it's weeds. the same thing with politics. Yeah. You know, they're all focused on getting reelected instead of trying to do what they can do when they're there. And raise money. Now, are you considering, right, it's money. <laughs> you, uh, do you, are you able to raise money for candidates? No. Or, no. So that's a good thing. I'm <laughs> delighted. I, I hate to say that, but anyway. So you're considered now a real mentor. I mean, not only do they call you what, I hate the term first lady, I'd rather say the queen or something, <laughs> the ruler of American magazines, but are you considered to be an exceptional mentor to, to women? Or to people? Um, I, I think so. It's not yeah. in an organized way, but I'm I'm happy to share my ideas and my thoughts. But I mean, I don't meet with somebody like every Monday or yeah, anything like right. that. But I, what I do know, and in fact, when I wrote the book, um, the letters that I received from women and men, but especially women, were absolutely remarkable. The consistent line was, "Why didn't I have this book 20 years ago? 30 years ago? 
five years ago. I, I had a letter from a woman in Italy about a month ago because the, the book sold about 150,000 copies, Great. New York Times bestsellers, Business yeah. Week, etc., Wall Street Journal, um, and it's now in 12 countries. So every <laughs> once in a while I will get a letter from somebody in Korea or, and I, my daughter's um, uh, boarding school roommate is Korean, and so I thought, I, oh, I'll give her the book. <laughs> <Right>. Finally, <laughs> somebody can read it in, in Korea. Uh, but, um, it's funny it was, when you get these books that you don't even know what the language is. I know, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's been a thrill because yeah. I think that it, it helped be a role model. Uh -huh. I mean, I, as I said, this is like a role model that you can, or uh, excuse me, this is like a portable mentor that you can put in your tote bag or put by your right. bedside or put on your office table or whatever. So because it is, it is simple in its approach as in, you know, li life is not that complicated. You really can boil it's it common down. common sense, yeah. isn't it? A yeah. lot of it. Yeah. So it's great. Are you going to write another book? I've thought of it. I'm not yeah. sure if I haven't told all my stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the book, you you not only give advice, but you illustrate it with wonderful stories. And so, and that's what people seem to remember. Yes. You know, yeah, they, they remember the, the story part of right. it. Um, Do you but, think that Ms. instilled a sensitivity? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's funny because I started to say that I lost my train of thought. Um, a woman doing introductions at this panel the other day mentioned something about her mentor uh, at one point, and then she said, you know, but I'm not a feminist. Oh, still. And when <laughs> I was on the panel, I said, you know, with all due respect, I said, you know, I spent years defending the word feminist, and I said, unfortunately, all these years later, it is a toxic word. It's incredible. And it never went away. And I said, we used to run an ad campaign that said, I'm not with famous people saying, I am not a feminist, but, and then they would describe <laughs> yeah. why they, in fact, really were. Um, so I think that, that all of that early training, um, I mean, they taught us business skills, it taught us presentation skills. You know, yeah. when we would go out with Gloria Steinem, the editor-in-chief, yeah to an ad agency, you know, we'd think three people would show up and there'd be, you know, 33 people, like, and frankly, you knew what they were there for. They <laughs> right. wanted to see what the freaks and weirdos looked right. like. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and we've come to the end of our half hour. Oh. That's so fast, but it's been so enjoyable and so important to see what goes into making a happy yeah. person because you not only have a great career, but you have a great family. I do. It's, I'm very lucky. We very didn't even lucky. talk about having it all, <laughs> but you do. Thanks, Kat. Thank you, dear. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Is there any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore? Please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.